but have there been any interventional studies which show mm. uh, ergothionine improves brain health? Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. So, you know, a lot of the assertions made in the past five to eight years on ergothionine is based on observational studies. And it's very interesting. We're seeing new observational studies coming out all the time. And so it's it's just great to see the same trend or the same link um, over time in you know different studies done by different groups all independently. So that's that's wonderful. But are there interventional studies to support brain health? And it's an exciting time right now because we're we're starting to see the interventional studies emerge right now. Um, we I will say that the preclinical evidence has been pretty strong. So in terms of mechanisms of how ergothionine might work, you know, ergothionine in preclinical models have been shown to protect neurons from oxidative damage, to support the mitochondria, modulate brain inflammation, um, even help with protein folding or um, helping with neuronal function. But in the past year and recently, we recently are witnessing the publication of two interventional trials looking at ergothionine and brain health. So uh, one trial looked at older adults with mild cognitive impairments, so MCI. And this study looked at either placebo or ergothionine at a dose of 25 milligrams a day, taken three times a week for one year. And so the ergothionine, and this was a pilot study, I believe the sample size was only 19. Um, the group tried to recruit, I, I think they screened over um, 1,500 subjects. And uh, the screening was done during COVID. So it was very, you know, it was, it was a very hard time um, to get patients to, to go in the hospital and to trust also, you know, just all the trust and wanting to take this, this dietary supplement. And so they were able to only get 19. But that's fine, because it's interesting, they, they found that um, ergothionine was able to improve, despite a small sample size, improve a cognitive domain related to memory and learning. And ergothionine supplementation compared to placebo was also able to lower a marker for uh, neurodegeneration, and that marker is called neuro, neurofilament light chain. So this, this study was done in, in, at the National University of Singapore by Barry Hallowell's lab. Um, that lab, uh, for any ergothionine enthusiasts, they probably have noticed, you know, there's there's a lot of papers coming out from that lab, and they are very passionate about ergothionine research, and they've been, you know, looking at ergothionine for probably 20 to 30 years. So that was a very, you know, impactful, um, high-impact paper. It was the first interventional study to really prove or show, provide evidence, I would say, to show that ergothionine supports mild cognitive impairment. So that creates the link um, between interventional studies and, and the observational studies that we're seeing. The other study, and I'm gonna take a little bit of time to talk about this because this is a study that we actually funded. Um, so it's a study that we initiated and funded. The study was conducted at the National Science Agency of Australia called CSIRO. And this study looked at healthy older adults with subjective memory complaints. And um, this, the reason why we looked at healthy humans is because we're developing ergothionine as a supplement and not a prescription drug. So not everyone knows this. People in our industry know this, um, but I know academic researchers as well as the general public may not know this. But as a company who's trying to develop a molecule for a dietary supplement, not a prescription drug, not something that you would have to go to the doctors and get a prescription for, we're restricted to looking at clinical trials in healthy humans. So we can't look at humans with dementia or Parkinson's or mild cognitive impairment. That's considered a disease. So of course, you know, clinical trial, it's very time consuming. It's it's expensive. Uh, we're not a drug company. We're a smaller company developing this ingredient. So we don't have, you know, ton of funding. Question is, what would you expect to see in people who are already healthy in terms of their cognitive function? So that's why we looked at healthy older adults who had subjective memory decline. Um, they had to take a validated survey. They, they failed on the survey that would indicate that they had subjective memory decline or complaints. So our trial had three arms, placebo versus 10 milligrams a day of ergothionine versus 25 milligrams a day of ergothionine. And we looked 
um, at supplementation for 16 weeks. 16 weeks, anyone who's experienced in cognitive trials, especially related to age-related cognitive um, decline or, you know, it's it's considered short. We're not looking at something like caffeine, you know, in the e-gamer world in which you take one shot and you're suddenly amped to play a game. We're looking at long-term function. We're looking at age-related cognitive decline. And so we looked at 16 weeks. 16 weeks is uh, very short, but the problem is a longer trial would be proportionally more money and much more time. So we decided to, okay, no one has ever looked at ergothionine for brain health in healthy subjects. We're going to, you know, do it quick. 16 weeks still will provide evidence and we'll see what happens. And if needed, we'll look at a longer term trial. Ironically, um, in parallel to the trial, uh, looking at MCI, our trial, even though it's 16 weeks, it happened, it took place during COVID and it still took two years to finish a 16 week trial. So that's something I wanted to explain because people don't realize, okay, you know, four month trial, you know, let's just get it done. I, I get formulators asking me all the time, can you help us with a clinical trial? I just want to get this done within a year or half a year. And I'm staring at them like, no, <laughs> there, you know, recruitment takes a long time. Everything takes a very, paperwork takes a long time, but we're very, very happy to get it done. So, okay. So, you know, that's that's a spiel about our clinical trial and why we looked at healthy humans. Not everyone knows about this. People in our, in our industry do. So what did we see? Um, we found that in our trial, ergothionine supplementation dose-dependently increased, first of all, um, efficacy scores. So in general, the higher dose you took, the better results you got in a shorter time frame if that makes sense. So we found that ergothionine accumulated in the blood. So the higher dose, meaning the 25 milligram dose per day versus the 10 milligram dose, the more you took, the higher levels of blood ergothionine was retained, much higher. So we did see this phenomenon of bioaccumulation. Um, if ergothionine was cleared rapidly, you would see kind of like a, you know, a steady a steady increase, but because ergothionine has a long half-life, it accumulates. The more you took, the more accumulation that you saw. So at the highest dose, 25 milligrams a day, ergothionine improved subjective memory compared to placebo. And there was a trend for the 10 milligram per day group. So it was a dose-dependent effect. Ergothionine was also able to improve subjective sleep initiation, which means it improved the person's ability to get to sleep. The objective measures, we looked at objective cognitive measures. They were more noisy compared to placebo. But in general, ergothionine supplementation improved more objective cognitive measures compared to before supplementation compared to placebo. So the objective measures were more noisy, and the reason might be a couple of reasons. Um, we're, we're just looking at one time point at 16 weeks. Um, the patients were coming in during COVID. There might have some anxiety. There's going to be always fluctuations in testing. And these subjects actually had higher uh, above average cognit baseline cognitive scores. So they were, even though they reported subjective memory complaints, they were actually already pretty pretty smart, if you will. So they were taking an antioxidant, hoping to boost their cognitive function. And so therefore the data for objective members, memory was noisy, but we saw very clear dose re de dependent response for subjective memory and sleep initiation. So these two trials are the first for ergothionine interventional trials. We'll see much more coming out because of these two trials. I would say they were risky trials. They're very supportive. They're supportive of ergothionine's potential benefit in MCI, and they're supportive of ergothionine's potential benefits in just a generally healthy population. So you have a longevity supplement, which by its definition is going to require a long time to have effect. Oh, yes. And then you only have 16 weeks. Um, <laughs> yes. Good thing we're not looking at lifespan. <laughs> so yeah. I, it, that would be impossible. Uh, yeah. Did you say how many people were in the different arms? Oh, I, I did not. So in our trial, we looked at 147. So we were targeting 150 and we were targeting, uh, there were three groups, right? So we were targeting 50, 50 per group. 
Uh, but what people don't know is recruitment just takes, you screen so many people and, you know, that all adds time and money. And by a certain point, you can't get the last one or two people to enroll. So we made the executive decision to stop at um, 147 rather than 150. But it was a pretty large trial. And, um, you know, a couple of, um, I would say, caveats is that, oh, there's the practical way of conducting the cl clinical trial and the perfect theoretical way. And so, you know, we've heard so much about, okay, if you have low ergothionine levels, that increases your risk for X, Y, and Z. So a clinical trial to look at, you know, these interventional effects is, okay, let's screen people for low ergothionine levels. And that has been brought up so many times, but if you're going to add that into screening and recruitment, that's going to take a year for recruiting anyone, screening everyone and seeing whether they have low ergothionine levels. So a practical approach is our way is just like, okay, let's just recruit based on our exclusion criteria, which is, okay, they had to fail on this memory, subjective memory test. They can't eat mushrooms. Um, they can't have, you know, a diagnosed sleep disorder. They had to be cognitively healthy. But let's just enroll. Uh, they had to be a certain age, above 55, I think. Um, but otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll recruit them. And then we measure their, their baseline ergothionine levels, and we measure their baseline cognitive function. And then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, and then just kind of work backwards. And what we found in our general population is that um, it was wildly variable in terms of the person's baseline ergothionine levels, even when we told them to not eat mushrooms. So I think that's really interesting. Um, in general, people had maybe unexpectedly slightly higher baseline ergothionine levels as we expected. So I don't, you know, we can't explain that, but it was just a wide range. And so, you know, that can play a role in, in the noisiness of the data. Um, but I always say, you know, people expect clean data. But for me as a scientist, I look at very clean data sometimes and I think, okay, I think they cherry picked the data, right? Um, science is actually very, very noisy, very dirty, especially when you're looking at a general human population. Mm -hmm.